Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. It all started well enough, or so I thought. I'd been seeing this guy named William for about two weeks after we matched on a popular dating app. He seemed perfectly normal, a decent guy with a good job, shared interest. We bonded over our mutual love of hiking, craft beer, and obscure indie fields. On our third date, William invited me over to his apartment downtown for a cozy night in. A home-cooked meal, some wine, maybe binge a new show on Netflix. I didn't think much of it at the time. We'd been taking things pretty slow physically, and I was just happy to spend more quality time getting to know him better in a relaxed setting. Little did I know, the evening would take an utterly chilling and sickening turn that would leave me feeling profoundly violated and questioning everything about the man I thought I knew. When I arrived at William's slick high-rise apartment, he greeted me warmly at the door with a lingering hug and kiss on the cheek. As I settled onto his plush charcoal gray sofa, a glass of crisp subbing and blends in hand, something immediately caught my eye, a small blinking red light in the corner of the living room. At first, I dismissed it as some sort of electronics gadget, or maybe just a tiny LED from the cable box across the room. But as I sat there trying to relax and enjoy the atmosphere William had cultivated, with soft jazz playing through the speakers and the warm amber glow of lit candles flickering, that nagging intuition persisted. I got up to investigate further, setting down my wine glass on the Lux marble top coffee table. And that's when my heart plummeted into my stomach. Carefully concealed behind a potted ficus tree was a tiny camera lens. Its sinister black eye pointed directly at the couch where we'd been sitting and sipping our beverages just moments before. My mind flooded with a swirling torrent of panicked thoughts and questions. Was this some kind of sick joke or misunderstanding? Or worse, was William secretly recording me in his home without my consent? A cold sweat started prickling the back of my neck as my stomach twisted into tight, nauseous knots. With slightly trembling hands, I anxiously scanned the rest of the posh living room space, and that's when the sickening truth became impossible to ignore or rationalize away. Nestled amongst the minimalist bookshelves against the opposite wall, I noticed another blinking red light coming from what seemed to be the lens of another hidden camera, and then another positioned near the entryway leading into the kitchen. With a sinking sense of dread rapidly enveloping me, I decided to thoroughly calm the rest of William's apartment to see just how deep and meticulously coordinated this perverted scheme went. My heart pounding with every step, I followed the sick, inescapable trail. What I discovered next made me want to vomit. Hidden cameras utterly littered every single room in the hallway of William's apartment. His bedroom, his bathroom, his home office. No space was spared from this unthinkable invasion of privacy. All strategically angled and meticulously concealed with surgical precision, like some sort of deranged art installation dedicated to the vilest exploitation of privacy and personal boundaries imaginable. My head spun with harsh static as the full, sickening realization dawned on me. William, this man I thought I could trust and felt increasingly strong feelings for, had been secretly recording our every movement, every conversation, every moment we'd spent together in that apartment without my knowledge or consent this entire time quite possibly broadcasting it lit over the internet for unknown deviants to leer at, or restoring the perverted footage for later, for who knows what depraved purposes. I felt utterly sickened, naked, exposed, like the very core of my soul, and being had been vulnerably laid bare and hostile, violating eyes without my permission. A cold, existential dread clung to every bone, every breath, every cell in my body. How could someone I seemingly knew Someone I did opening up to and caring for on a deeper level perpetrate such a malicious and premeditated violation of my personal privacy, autonomy, and boundaries. As the agonizing seconds ticked by in that awful, fraught silence, a torrent of terrifying questions flooded my consciousness. How long had William been pulling this incomprehensible, unforgivable stunt? Was I his only victim shamefully preyed upon, or were there others before me who had unknowingly fallen prey to his repulsive scheme? A kaleidoscope of worst-case scenarios play in a harrowing loop in my mind's eye. 
the thought of him potentially making duplicates of that private footage to share, exploit, and profit from filled me with an indescribable soul. I was brimming with excitement for my second date with Mark. We had an amazing first date that lasted hours just talking in a cozy coffee shop. The conversation flowed effortlessly and we really seemed to click. Mark was so charming, cracking jokes and appearing genuinely interested in learning all about me and my life. When we finally parted ways, I felt like there was real potential between us. So when Mark asked me out again, I eagerly said yes without any hesitation. We made plans to try a new upscale French restaurant downtown that had been getting rave reviews. I took extra time getting ready, carefully picking out a new black cocktail dress that I thought Mark would love. I even went to the salon to get my hair styled and my nails done with a classy marble design. Makeup had to be perfect too. I did a dramatic smoky eye with bold lashes and a matte red lip. I wanted to feel like a million bucks for our special date night. Right on time, Mark arrived to pick me up looking sharp in a fitted suit, but his reaction to seeing me all dolled up was lackluster at best. He glanced at my dress and mumbled, you look fine, I guess. Ouch, not exactly the compliment I was hoping for after spending so much time getting ready. A little knot of disappointment formed in my stomach, but I brushed it off, thinking maybe he was just nervous for the date. Things didn't improve much when we got to the restaurant. The hostess sat us at an intimate table for two with candles and roses, but Mark barely looked up from his menu to acknowledge her. When our server came by, Mark was so abrupt answering her questions about drinks and appetizers. She was just doing her job, so I didn't understand why he had to be so rude and dismissive toward her. Once we ordered, an uncomfortable silence fell over the table. I racked my brain trying to get the conversation going again, asking Mark about his job and his week. But his responses were lifeless one-word answers. He clearly had no interest in keeping the chat flowing. Instead, he launched into a long, winding story about office politics at work and conflicts with his boss. I tried interjecting a few times to reciprocate about my own crazy week, but Mark just steamrolled over me and continued venting. About halfway through our main course's arriving, I realized Mark was barely making eye contact with me at all. He kept glancing down at his phone, scrolling and texting periodically throughout the meal. When I asked we kept messaging, he brushed it off saying it was just his group chat with coworkers. But the constant distracted texting made me feel like an afterthought on a date I had been so excited for. The final straw was when Mark's phone started buzzing with a call mid-bite and he actually answered it at our table. As he chatted loudly with a colleague or friend, he waved his hand dismissively at me, signaling for me to just sit quietly until he was done. I was so shocked and offended that he would take a personal call in the middle of our date. But I didn't want to cause a scene in this fancy restaurant, so I just sat there awkwardly until he finally hung up several minutes later. When the check came, Mark didn't even flinch to take it. He just sat there on his phone until I reluctantly offered that we could split it. He readily agreed, also letting me cover the entire tip without any offer to chip in. Some gentleman he was turning out to be. The ride back to my place was painfully quiet after the disastrous dinner. When Mark walked me to my door, I waited for some kind of redeeming goodbye, a compliment, an apology, anything. But all he said was, see you around, before walking away without even a hug or peck on the cheek. Looking back, it was obvious Mark's true colors came out on our second date. The signs were all there from the start. His lukewarm reaction to my outfit, the dismissive treatment of the waitstaff, talking over me during conversation, constant texting, and taking that call at the table. At every turn, he managed to be rude, inconsiderate, and completely self-absorbed, showing no interest in me, my life, or our date. I'm glad I got to see who Mark really was before I wasted any more of my time and energy on him. While our first meetup seemed so promising, this follow-up showed his real personality, arrogant, entitled, and devoid of basic respect or manners. I deserve to be with someone who values me, treats me well, and gives me their undivided attention. This was a good lesson in looking out for red flags beyond just a charming first impression. Someone's behavior in subsequent interactions and environments reveals their priorities and true character. I'd rather learn sooner than later if a guy will dismiss or mistreat me once the initial novelty wears off. At least this experience will make me a better judge of character for the next promising first date. I won't ignore warning signs simply because of some initial butterflies. 
my time and affection are too valuable to squander on someone who can't maintain common courtesy or interest past the first meetup. Here's hoping the next guy actually turns out to be as great as he seems. I'm keeping the bar high and will watch carefully for those red flags now. I still remember every detail of that first date with Alex. We met at a bustling cafe downtown, the smell of coffee and baked goods wafting through the air. Alex looked just like their pictures. Stylish jeans, warm smile, eyes that crinkled at the corners when they laughed. We grabbed lats and cinnamon rolls before settling into cushioned armchairs near the back. The conversation flowed easily as we discovered shared interests, indie folk music, true crime podcasts, hiking and camping. Alex told me about their job as a graphic designer, their close-knit family back home. I found myself chatting comfortably about my work as a teacher, my passion for photography. Two hours slipped by in what felt like minutes. Alex walked me to my car, gave me a quick hug. I drove home reflecting on the afternoon. Alex was undoubtedly attractive, funny, and kind. But that mysterious spark, that jolt of electricity I hoped to feel with someone special, it just wasn't there. I pensively stared at my phone the next day, crafting the perfect message to send. I thanked Alex for the great date, but explained I saw us better as friends. I hit send and exhaled, confident I'd handled the letdown with care. I jolted awake at 2 a.m. to my phone vibrating incessantly on the nightstand. Disoriented, I squinted against the glare to see a flood of unread texts from an unknown number. Lengthy paragraphs waxing poetic about our electric chemistry, our undeniable connection. Promises that Alex could be better, do better, if only I'd go on another date. I had no idea how they'd gotten my number. Uneasy, I put my phone on silent and tried to go back to sleep. The next morning, I rose bleary eye and scrambled to block the mysterious number. But throughout the day, the phone rang from a revolving door of unknown callers. Voice messages pleading and demanding another chance. Threatening to show up at my apartment invited in reply. I felt sick. Was this really the same person I'd chatted with so comfortably just days before? That night, I double-checked the locks on my doors and shut the blinds. But I barely slept between the incessant buzzing of my silenced phone on the nightstand and the nagging feeling that I was being watched. The calls eventually stopped, but an onslaught of texts began. Long diatribes analyzing why we were destined to be together, accusing me of leading Alex on if I refused to go out again. Interspersed were chilling observations of mundane details of my day. The route of my morning run, the blueberry muffin I'd eaten for breakfast. My hands trembled as I told my close friend Donna about the stalking, and she insisted I go to the police right away. At the station, an officer took down my statement with a sympathetic nod. But he sighed and said that since Alex hadn't directly threatened me, there was little they could do. I left feeling even more helpless and alone. The next weeks were a blur of constant anxiety as I looked over my shoulder everywhere I went. Brief glimpses from the corner of my eye made my heart stop, a baseball cap like Alex's, a figure ducking around a corner. Strange prisons began showing up at my door, my favorite treats, books I'd once mentioned in passing. I started noticing unfamiliar cars idling near my apartment. Knock sounded late at night, though no one was there when I checked. I barely slept jolting awake at every creak of the old building. I stopped going out, ignored friends' concerned texts. I felt like a prisoner in my own home. And beneath the fear was a simmering rage. How dare Alex steal my freedom and peace of mind like this? Dana came over one day and found me crumpled on the couch, shaking and pale from stress. She sat with me and listened as I tearfully recounted the barrage of calls, gifts, and invasive tracking. Her forehead creased in worry as she scrolled through dozens of unread texts from unknown numbers. She offered to let me stay at her place that night, but I refused to be driven from my home. The next day, she returned with supplies to install motion sensor lights, an alarm system, and security cameras. We're going to get through this, she told me with a fierce hug. Reinvigorated by my friend's support, I decided to go back to the police. I arrived armed with a log of every disturbing text, every worrisome incident and suspicious gift. This time, the officer's eyes widened in alarm as he paged through my meticulous notes. This is serious, he said gravely. He agreed to contact Alex with a stern warning. But things only escalated. 
The texts rage about police overreach and vowed never to leave me alone. My door rattled violently late at night as I cowered in bed. Strange cars regularly circled my block. Dark figures darted through the shadows whenever I went outside. My new security system provided some relief, but I knew more had to be done. Donna helped me research steps to take out a restraining order. The thought of seeing Alex in court recounting all the ways they'd terrorized me made my chest tighten. But refusing to be silent was my only remaining power. Today marks one month since the restraining order was granted. With Alex legally barred from contacting me, the endless calls and texts trailed off. The police assigned a patrol car to drive by my apartment periodically to deter any unwanted visitors. I still feel a trickle of my knees walking to my car or seeing a stranger approach on the street. But with time, I hope the vice grip of fear will continue to loosen. Alex's violation of my life and trust can never be undone. But I refuse to remain a victim. They wanted me a cower. Instead, I found my voice. The road stretches long ahead, but I'm moving forward, one step at a time, into the light. When I first met Mason at my friend Amanda's birthday party, I felt an instant spark between us. He was standing by the snacks table, his stylish glasses and button-up shirt catching my eye from across the room. When our eyes met, he smiled, and I felt my heart do a little flip. I made my way over to the table casually, not wanting to seem too eager. Up close, his warm brown eyes and dimpled grin were even more charming. We started chatting about the party, the decorations Amanda had picked out, the crazy karaoke going on in the living room. The conversation flowed easily, which surprised me since I could be shy around cute guys. But Mason was so friendly and funny, making me laugh with witty observations and banter. I found myself impressed by how quick and sharp his mind was. He had an effortless confidence and passion in the way he spoke. After about 20 minutes of sparking connection, he asked for my number. I happily gave it to him, thrilled when he immediately sent me a text so I'd have his number too. I couldn't wipe the smile off my face for the rest of the night, already looking forward to what could happen between us. Our first date was at a cozy Italian restaurant that Mason picked. He brought me a beautiful bouquet of tulips, which made me blush. Over the song and wine, we talked about our families, our taste in music and movies, embarrassing childhood phases. Mason told me funny stories about his failed attempts at skateboarding as a teen. I confessed my obsession with boy bands and how I dressed up like Britney Spears with my best friend to perform full choreographed dance routines. Everything felt so comfortable and natural with Mason. We sat in the restaurant for hours, closing the place down. After he paid the bill like a gentleman, he suggested a walk through the nearby park. Under the starry night sky, he took my hand for the first time, sending tingles up my arm. When he kissed me softly near a glistening pond, it felt like the most romantic moment of my life. The next few months were blissful. We spent as much time together as we could. Dinners out, movies, hikes. Mason was always planning thoughtful dates, surprising me with gifts like a necklace with my birthstone or my favorite Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavor. I'd never been treated so special by a boyfriend before. He made me feel beautiful, interesting, cherished. My feelings for him deepened rapidly. When I first noticed small changes, I tried to brush them off. If I wanted to see my friends for a girl's night, Mason would guilt me, asking why he wasn't enough for me. If I mentioned an attractive male celebrity, he'd sulk and make passive-aggressive comments until I reassured him of my devotion. He didn't like the clothes I wore to clubs, saying other men shouldn't see that much of me. At first, I thought it was sweet that he got a little jealous and wanted me himself. But over several months, the control tightened. If I didn't text Mason back immediately, he berate me for ignoring him and threatened to end things. He'd interrogate me if I came home 20 minutes later than expected, convinced I was hiding some illicit activity. Normal interactions with male co-workers became ammunition for accusations of flirting or cheating. I started just staying home alone when not with Mason, avoiding friendships and activities he disapproved of. His temper was unpredictable. Little things would set him off. Not liking a meal I cooked, me wanting to watch a TV show he considered stupid, he would go into rages, throwing things and calling me names over such trivial matters. Then minutes later, he'd apologize and promise to change, blaming stress from work. I believed in every time, remembering the man I first fell for. When I confronted Mason about his control issues, he insisted he was just trying to build a life together. 
He said no man would be comfortable with his girlfriend running around with other guys. I must be neglecting his needs if I was constantly wanting outside attention. I started doubting myself, wondering if I was being unreasonable or difficult. The marriage counselor said relationships require compromise, so I silenced my misgivings and let Mason call the shots. By the end, my self-esteem was shredded. Mason's conditioning had me believing I was worthless, stupid, ugly, worthless without him. I was isolated from friends and walking on eggshells any time we were together. The abuse had chipped away my identity bit by bit until I was a shadow of myself, just trying to survive each day. In a moment of clarity, I saw a couple's counselor alone. She affirmed my experience was extremely unhealthy and gave me the strength to leave Mason. Ending things was painful. He begged me not to go, vowing to get help. But staying with him was destroying me. I filed a restraining order and rebuilt my life one day at a time. Though the scars linger, I'm proud of my journey. I found an amazing therapist and support group who taught me the warning signs of emotional abuse. I now have strong boundaries and the confidence to walk away early from any red flags. Most importantly, I will never again let someone manipulate me into giving up my spirit and voice. Surviving Mason's torment has made me wiser and shown me how strong I truly am. So I had been using the dating app on and off for months, but most matches either never responded or the conversation fizzled out after a few polite back and forth messages. I was beginning to think I'd never meet anyone worthwhile on there, but then I matched with Alex. His main profile picture showed a handsome guy around my age with warm brown eyes and a friendly, genuine smile. His bio said he enjoyed hiking, trying new hole in the wall restaurants, and volunteering at the animal shelter on weekends. We started chatting and really hit it off right away. The conversation just seemed to flow effortlessly from our favorite childhood movies to embarrassing high school stories to hopes and dreams for the future. Over the next several weeks, Alex and I messaged each other every single day. He was smart, funny, and seemed so kind and thoughtful. I felt like I could open up and tell him anything without judgment. For the first time in a long while, I was genuinely excited about someone I had met online. So when Alex finally asked me out on a real first date, I immediately said yes without any hesitation. We had plans to meet up for dinner at a new Thai restaurant downtown that he had been wanting to try out. I probably spent way too much time getting ready, but I wanted to look perfect. I did my makeup just so, styled my hair in loose curls, and picked out a floral sundress that I knew looked cute on me. This felt different than my other lackluster first dates from the app. Alex and I already had. Such a strong connection from our endless messaging, and I just knew in my gut this could lead to something real. I arrived at the restaurant before Alex and slid into a small table at the front window so I would be able to watch for him walking up. Every time I saw movement out of the corner of my eye as the door opened, my stomach did an excited little flip. But after 15 minutes had passed, the thrilling anticipatory genius turned into worry. It wasn't like Alex not to message me if he was running late or stuck in traffic. I said a quick everything oak text but didn't hear back. After half an hour of sitting there fidgeting alone, I was ready to give up and go home, feeling silly for having such high hopes. But just then, I saw a very tall, broad-shouldered man approaching my table with intent. He had a muscular, imposing build, definitely not the slender, almost boyish-looking guy I was expecting based on Alex's photos. This man's clothes were badly rumpled and dirty. As he got closer, I noticed an unsettling hollowness in his eyes that made me shrink back instinctively in my seat. Every nerve was telling me this man was dangerous. Hey there, sorry I'm so late. Crazy traffic across town. The man said in an oddly gravelly voice as he folded himself into the chair across from me. It took me a minute to comprehend that this was apparently Alex. Or at least, the person claiming to be Alex. None of it made any sense. I stammered some confused greeting, staring at him in disbelief as he grinned back at me with crooked yellowed teeth. Up close, looking past the curtain of unwashed hair, I could see his cracked lips and deeply weathered skin covered in Apache scruff. He looked to be in his mid-forties, nowhere close to thirty-something Alex from the dating app. This ratty, intimidating man looked absolutely nothing like the clean-cut pictures I had seen, and he definitely didn't act like the same person either. He started rambling loudly about himself, but it was largely incoherent and twitchy. Nothing like the calm, thoughtful conversationalist I knew from our messages. 
I sat perfectly still, frozen in place as the alarm bells continued blaring in my head. This couldn't possibly be Alex, could it? The more the stranger prattled on with bizarre, disconnected stories about people I'd never heard of, the more certain I became that this was all wrong. Whoever this man actually was, he had clearly catfished me. I felt so stupid. How could I have not realized those perfect pictures and charming personality were too good to be true? My mind races, I subtly tried to scan the restaurant, wondering how to get out of there safely. It was still very crowded, and I hoped I could signal a server to discreetly come help me. But the man seemed to notice my distraction and quickly suggested we leave right away and take a walk outside since it was too noisy to talk here. Every instinct screamed at me not to go anywhere alone with this alarming imposter. When the check came, I threw down enough cash to cover my untouched diet soda and mumbled that I suddenly wasn't feeling well. I claimed I must have caught that awful stomach bug that's been going around and just needed to get home as soon as possible. The man looked irritated, his fake polite act slipping as I clearly wasn't going along with his plan anymore. As I abruptly stood up to leave, he grasped my wrist tightly. I panicked and yanked my arm back aggressively, my heart pounding. For just a second, I saw a flash of real anger behind those hollow eyes that truly frightened me. I quickly muttered goodbye and rushed out of the restaurant, not looking back as the man called after me in frustration. I jumped into an Uber, still shaking with adrenaline and shock. As the car pulled away, tears of violation welled in my eyes. I was devastated that someone could go to such elaborate lengths to deceive me just to get me alone. I kept replaying our friendly conversations in my head, trying to understand how I could have been so completely fooled by a stranger on the internet. That night, I immediately deleted the dating app for good. I was done trying to find love in what was clearly a dangerous world of empty promises and false connections. How could I ever truly trust that someone online was who they claimed to be? This bizarre experience had shattered my faith in online dating. I wanted real human connections again, not just flirty words on a screen. I had ignored too many subtle red flags along the way, so blinded by my deep desire to believe I had found an amazing guy. But that perfect man was merely the fantasy I had fallen for, not reality. I just had to keep reminding myself that not everyone online is who they pretend to be. When I first met Rob at my friend Amanda's birthday party, I was instantly drawn to his charm and good looks. With his bright blue eyes, dimpled smile, and smooth conversational skills, he seemed absolutely perfect. We hit it off right away, talking and laughing all night. At the end of the party, he asked for my number and I eagerly gave it to him, thrilled that this handsome, fun guy wanted to go out with me. Our first date was like something out of a romantic comedy. Rob took me to a swanky Italian restaurant downtown and showered me with compliments all night. He said I was the most beautiful, intelligent, refreshing woman he had ever met. I practically floated home that night, giddy with excitement about this new relationship. The next few weeks were blissful. We went out several times a week trying new restaurants, taking long walks by the lake, even dancing at the local clubs occasionally. Rob was affectionate and attentive, always holding my hand or putting his arm around me. When we were apart, he would send me cute texts saying he couldn't stop thinking about me. I loved how he made me feel like the most important person in his world. But after about a month of dating, I started to notice small changes in Rob's behavior. We'd be getting dressed for dinner and he would make seemingly innocent comments about my outfit being too revealing or risque. I thought he was just being a little old-fashioned at first, but the remarks became more frequent, escalating from, don't you think that neckline is too low, to you look like you're asking for trouble dressed like that. Taken aback, I'd respond that I felt good in these clothes and didn't think I looked inappropriate. He'd quickly backtrack and insist I looked gorgeous no matter what, he just wanted me to be comfortable. But the criticisms continued. Over time, Rob moved beyond just my clothing choices to commenting on my hair, makeup, even my laugh being too loud. I started to feel extremely self-conscious around him. Around the same time, Rob also began voicing concerns about my friends. My college buddy Josh came into town and wanted to get dinner. When I mentioned it to Rob, he even easily said, Josh clearly has a thing for you. I don't think you should see him one-on-one. -on -one. I tried to laugh it off, but Rob remained firm. Soon, he also took issue with my friend Amanda, saying she was immature and reckless, likely to drive me into wild situations. 
Even my own sister Anna was deemed too strong-willed and independent by Rob. The list of friends and family he took objection to kept growing. At first, I made excuses for Rob's behavior and tried to smooth things over. I assumed he was just a little protective due to bad past experiences. But over time, his control and criticisms chipped away at my self-esteem. I grew paranoid about setting him off, changing my clothes, personality, even my speech to keep Rob happy. Nothing I did felt good enough. The night he demanded my social media passwords was the breaking point. When I refused in shock, Rob flew into a terrifying rage unlike anything I'd ever seen. He hurled insults at me, calling me pathetic, stupid, useless. He slammed his fists on the table inches from my face, making me cower. The screaming tirade went on for hours until I finally gave in, hands shaking as I handed over my phone. I sat there weeping silently as Rob scored every inch of my digital life, seething over any male name he found. The days that followed blurred together into a haze of walking on eggshells. Rob had isolated me from everyone except himself. He monitored my phone constantly, read my emails, even timed how long it took me to come home from work. I felt like a prisoner in my own life. One night, I broke down sobbing and called my sister Anna for the first time in months. Through tears, I told her what had been going on and admitted I was terrified of what Rob might do next. Anna came straight over, helped me pack a bag, and drove me back to her apartment. The relief I felt at escaping that situation was indescribable, like breathing fresh air for the first time in ages. Though it took me a long time to regain my sense of self, I'm forever grateful that I found the courage to ask for help when I needed it most. Rob's emotional abuse tried. To diminish my spirit, but ultimately it made me stronger. I want anyone in a similar situation to know that you are worthy of love and respect. You would not accept cruelty or control from your partner, even if you've been made to feel powerless. Take back your freedom and write your own happy ending. I still vividly remember the night I met him. It was a Friday evening and I had just gotten home from a long week at the office. My best friend Lucy had been begging me for weeks to start online dating, insisting I needed to get back out there after my recent breakup. I finally caved and downloaded one of those trendy new dating apps for young professionals. I think it was called Swipe or something equally catchy. After adding some cute photos and a quick bio, I started swiping. There were a lot of finance bros and techies named Chad, numb catching my eye. Then his profile appeared. A photo of him mountain biking, wind tussling his thick, dark hair. His bio said he was a software engineer who enjoyed hiking, cooking, and indie films. He just seemed so normal and down-to-earth compared to the other cocky man on the app. I immediately swiped right, and we matched right away. We started messaging back and forth. He had a great sense of humor and kept me laughing out loud with his witty banter. After two weeks of fun, natural conversations, he finally asked me out to dinner. I happily accepted. We planned to meet on that upcoming Saturday night at a cozy Italian restaurant called Bella Luna, one of my favorite local spots. I spent way too much time getting ready, shuffling through my entire closet. I finally settled on a black wrap dress and strappy heels, adding a pop of red lipstick. I was a bundle of first aid nerves and excitement as the Uber pulled up to the restaurant. I stepped inside and immediately spotted him at a table tucked in the far corner. He stood up with a warm smile as I approached. He looked even better in person, taller than I expected with broad shoulders and two days of stubble. We exchanged a slightly awkward hug hello before sitting down across from each other. The hostess had seated us at a quiet table lit gently by a low-hanging ornate lamp. She handed us menus with a flourish, promising the chef would take excellent care of us before disappearing toward the kitchen. The conversation flowed easily as we poured over the massive menus, discussing our favorite Italian dishes and wines. I learned that we shared an affinity for big bowls of pasta and bold reds. We decided to split an epic five cheese lasagna along with a bottle of Chianti. Waiting for our food, we dove into getting to know each other. I told him all about my close relationship with my two sisters, crazy childhood antics, and our family's annual beach vacations. He regaled me with hilarious stories about his co-workers' weird lunchtime rituals and the office prank war currently underway. I realized over candlelight that he was just as charming, quick-witted, and intelligent as his texts had indicated. We also shared a similar sarcastic sense of humor, 
and many interests like cycling, indie films, and dreaming of future adventures abroad. The conversation flowed so naturally it felt like talking to an old friend. The food was delicious and I'd polished off several generous glasses of Bellevue red wine. I was feeling awfully charmed. But ultimately that romance spark just wasn't igniting for me. He was attractive and wonderful on paper, a total catch. Yet my gut instinct kept nagging that we lacked an indefinable chemical attraction. As we split tiramisu and strolled outside the restaurant holding hands, I gently suggested we stay in touch as friends. Disappointment flashed across his face, but he took it well, kissing me lightly on the cheek and hailing me a cab. I felt relief as the car pulled away, realizing I had made the right call listening to my intuition. Back home, I changed into PKs excited to catch up on Netflix and wind down after an enjoyable but exhausting first date. The next morning, as I sipped coffee and scrolled aimlessly through work emails, a text popped up from him on my phone. Thanks again for last night. Not gotta lie, I was bummed by the friend zone, but you're amazing and I'd love to stay in touch. I smiled, appreciating the maturity of his response and wrote back that I had a great time as well and let's keep chatting as buddies. I put my phone away, ready to fully move on with my day. But then it dinge again just minutes later. By the way, that black dress you wore was so hot. And the way you smiled at me, I can't stop thinking about it. I felt immediate unease reading this much more effusive message. It seemed like an attempt to backtrack on my wishes to just be friends. I put down my phone, hoping we both just needed a little space. But to my dismay, the floodgates then burst open. My phone buzzed incessantly as overly flirtatious texts extolling my beauty rolled in every couple of minutes. He gushed elaborately about how mesmerized he was by my sparkling green eyes, how he had stared at my lips all night fantasizing about kissing them. I cringed reading these fawning words from someone I had just gently rejected. When I didn't respond to the barrage, his tone quickly shifted to pleading. Text after text begged me to reconsider, insisting we had a connection like no other, and it had been the best night of his life. He desperately professed that he knew in his heart we were meant to be together. I felt increasingly uncomfortable with his refusal to accept my boundaries. I firmly reiterated that I just wanted to remain casual friends, nothing more. But spurned further, his messages then became angry and accusatory. He lashed out that I had led him on and played mind games maliciously. He vilified me as a cold-hearted, arrogant, good-for-nothing who had callously taken advantage of his feelings. I was alarmed reading these vulgar attacks from the same man who had seemed so gracious in person the night before. Each hostile message became more unhinged than the last. I finally blocked his number, my hands shaking. But this only caused the harassment to escalate and take new forms. He began manically calling me from blocked and unknown numbers, leaving a barrage of voicemails when I refused to pick up. At first, the messages conveyed heartfelt apologies asking for another chance. But they quickly turned vile and threatening, calling me every disgusting name under the sun. I felt sick hearing the sheer hatred and instability in his voice, rambling like a deranged lunatic. After days of constant calls, I finally answered to unambiguously demand he never contact me again. He immediately shifted to hysterical sobbing, pathetically begging for one more date. I hung up, even more disturbed by his complete psychotic break from reality. From there, the stalking started in real life. I would notice his shadowy figure parked outside my gym in the mornings. If I stopped for coffee before work, he'd mysteriously also be there pretending to read a newspaper. The first few times I thought it was an awful coincidence. But when he deliberately approached me one night in the cereal aisle of my local grocery store, I realized with horror he was intentionally tracking my every move. That night still gives me chills thinking back on it. I was picking up a few things after work, wandering aimlessly down the fluorescent aisles. Out of nowhere I sensed someone behind me and turned to find him blocking my path, standing inches from me. He immediately started crying about how he couldn't live without me, backing me up against towering shells of Cheerios. I was paralyzed by fear until I managed to duck under his arm and run out of the store in sheer terror as he called after me. I became a prisoner in my own home after that, riddled with anxiety whenever I had to go anywhere alone. I stopped being able to focus at work, instead agonizing about when he might show up again. His unhinged emails poured in, alternating between professing his undying devotion and threatening me if I didn't get back together with him. He claimed he knew exactly where I lived and would camp outside my apartment 24 sevenths until I took him back. 
I never should have swiped right on his profile that evening from the comfort of my couch. I never could have imagined my simple finger tap starting an unstoppable chain reaction leading to months of harassment by my dangerous stalker. But I had let him into my digital space and in turn, he forced his way into my real world. Things were going so well between Mark and me those first few months. We had an instant connection from our very first date at that little Italian restaurant downtown. Conversation flowed easily, and we always had so much to talk and laugh about. Mark just got me, you know. And he was so thoughtful, always bringing me flowers or remembering my favorite candy bar at the checkout line. I felt like I could truly be myself with him. We were inseparable, spending every free moment together, whether going out or just cuddling on his couch watching movies. So I was surprised when Mark's ex-girlfriend, Lisa, suddenly seemed to be everywhere we went. At first, I thought it was just an eerie coincidence. That she was at our favorite burger place when Mark and I went out to eat. I spotted her car in the parking lot when we went to the movies that weekend. Once could be chance, but when it kept happening, it became clear she was seeking Mark out. I asked him about it, and he seemed surprised, but shrugged it off, saying they had been broken up for over a year, and she was not someone I needed to worry about. He reassured me I was the only one for him now. But Lisa's constant presence whenever Mark and I were out soon became unnerving. Whether we were grocery shopping or going for a walk in the park, she always seemed to turn up. I even noticed her park down the street from Mark's house a couple of times late at night when I was leaving. I started to feel like I couldn't get away from her. Mark kept telling me to just ignore her and focus on our relationship, but it was hard to do that with her shadowing our every move. Things with Lisa came to a head one Saturday when Mark and I attended his friend John's backyard barbecue. We were having a great time socializing and I went inside to use the restroom. When I returned, Lisa was standing in the yard screaming at Mark about what a huge mistake he was making being with me and how I could never understand him like she did. She was making a huge scene, ranting and raving. All the guests stood staring in shocked silence. I felt my face turn bright red with embarrassment. Mark told Lisa firmly that she needed to leave immediately, but she kept yelling, saying she wasn't going anywhere and Mark belonged with her. Eventually, John had to call the police to escort her away for trespassing. After the party, Mark told me how sorry he was about what had happened and that he had no idea Lisa would take things so far. He said he was going to have a serious talk with her to make the threats and harassment stop for good. I really hoped that would be the end of it and Lisa would finally leave us in peace. But over the next few weeks, the stalking and intimidation only got worse. One night when Mark and I went on a dinner date downtown, we came out of the restaurant to find his car tires slashed. I was terrified, thinking Lisa could be capable of anything. A few days later, I started getting threatening anonymous messages online saying she was going to make me pay for stealing Mark from her. Our outings were constantly disrupted by her driving by yelling or calling Mark's cell phone dozens of times. I had never been so frightened and unsettled. Mark finally agreed we needed more help and we went to the police station together to file for a restraining order against Lisa. The police paid her a visit and formally warned her she would face charges if she continued contacting us against our will. For extra safety, Mark and I even moved into a new apartment together across town, hoping the change routine would make it harder for Lisa to find us. The police intervention seemed to work at first. For a few blissful weeks, Lisa left us alone. Mark and I were finally able to relax and start to rebuild our relationship without the constant stress of her harassment. To celebrate, we took a romantic weekend trip out of town. Those two days felt like the honeymoon we never had. No looking over our shoulders, no worrying about Lisa popping up unexpectedly. But of course, it was too good to last. Shortly after getting home, the threatening late night drive-bys and phone calls started up again. Bizarre packages kept appearing on the doorstep. Children's toys, empty jewelry boxes, old mementos from Mark and Lisa's relationship. I was completely creeped out. At that point, Mark agreed we needed more drastic action. We went back to the police armed with evidence of all of Lisa's escalating infractions. This time, they arrested her for violating the restraining order. Thankfully, the court mandated that Lisa undergo psychiatric treatment and even serve jail time for her dangerous harassment of us. Finally, having Lisa out of our lives for good was an enormous relief. Mark and I could stop constantly watching our backs and finally focus on moving forward together. The past several months since her arrest have been so calm and hopeful. 
Our relationship feels closer than ever after weathering the storm as a team. I'm so grateful to have such a caring partner by my side. And I can breathe easy knowing that twisted nightmare with his ex is well and truly behind us. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.